Okay. Glad you're all here, including those of our friends who are at home online. Uh, and I'm happy to welcome you all to this moment of sharing about planned giving, which is uh, another um, way that we can be good stewards of the resources that have been entrusted to us and to think about the life of our families and uh, the church into the future. So um, I think maybe our first move will be to just acknowledge the um, presence and support, it's presence in quotation marks, <laughs> of Vicki Nelson, who is our stewardship and um, planned giving kind of animator for our region. She ha has come to meetings with our small group and uh, was intending to come to this event and unfortunately had a family event that um, interrupted that intention. So happily, she made a little video for us, which Joanna is going to play for us just by way of introduction so that you can see her face and know who she is. And then we're going to pass things over first to George and then to Richard. Greetings. My name is Vicki Nelson and I'm the Community of Faith Stewardship Support Person for Pacific Mountain Region as well as a few other regions west of you folks. Um, I'm so sorry I couldn't be with you in person in Delta um, or even um, live via Zoom, but I had uh, family commitments today. I'm really excited that Crossroads United Church is having a conversation around planned and legacy giving. And um, from what I've heard and read, Richard, who's presenting for this meeting, has a, a ton of expertise and experience. And so I hope you folks get a ton, the information you need to make a legacy gift to your United Church, to Mission and Service, or to another organization that you deeply care about. And speaking of that, the United Church does have some resources to help with that work, including this will workbook. <laughs> uh, Carrie has copies of those um, physically in person. So if you're at a place where you're updating your will in a, in a large way, or you don't have a current will, this workbook can, you can fill it out and it can sort of help you answer some questions and get all that information set up. It's also a great idea to share that information with your loved ones, with your executor, um, with your children, your grandchildren, your spouse, your family, so that everybody knows um, what you're thinking about and what you're hoping for uh, at the end of your life. And so, I am here as the stewardship support person to help answer some questions, to get you resources you might need. To specifically, I can answer questions as well about different funds in the United Church. If there's a an area of ministry that you want to leave some some money to, or that you'd like to make a donation to uh, within your life, I can help with that. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put my email address up on the bottom of this video, uh, and so feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Um, yeah, if you know, I'm here to support you. That's my job. So again, I'm sorry that I'm not able to be there in person, but uh, do get in contact with me. I'd love to hear from you and enjoy the rest of this presentation. And you know, huge thanks to Carrie and John and. Um, George and Richard and everybody else who's taking care of this presentation. Um, it's it's going to be good. Have a great afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Vicki. Uh, my name is George, and uh, I have sometimes uh, made comments when I shouldn't. <laughs> a few months ago, we had a guest minister in the church who ended his sermon with a statement that he did not know why people don't name the United Church in their will. He concluded with these words, I just don't know why. So I told Reverend Carey, I thought that was a pretty dumb way to end a sermon. I said, if you don't know something, why don't you find out? Well, my big mouth got me in trouble. Reverend Carey invited John Charlesworth, a chartered accountant, and me to lunch. And before we knew it, we're on a committee about planned giving. <laughs> and through my contact at Audelon Brown, which is a century-old investment firm celebrating 100 years this year, I was able to talk by phone to today's guest, Richard Myers. Richard is a chartered professional accountant, CPA, 
and a certified financial planner, CFP, professional. He has also completed a CPA Canada's in-depth tax program and is a sessional instructor for the Chartered Professional Accountants of BC. I think we'll all agree he's a very qualified guy. And without fee and giving up his own time on a Sunday, Richard has kindly devoted some of his weekend time to be with us here today to talk about estate planning, which includes tax planning. Let us all welcome Richard Myers. Thank you, George. Appreciate that. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming today. Uh, as George said, um, I think I have... Oh, it worked earlier. Where's the clicker point, girls? I wonder if it's just out of range. I don't know if I've ever been this far away. Okay, we might have to kibosh this one. Okay. There's way too many slides about who I am. Uh, I am required to have it in all of my presentations. Oh, it decided it was going to work. Or maybe Joanna was me. Oh. Okay. Bunch of slides on who I was. Uh, as George said, thank you very much. Uh, chartered accountant. I specialize in income tax. I work for Audlem Brown Financial Services. We are a subsidiary of Audlem Brown, an investment firm. Uh, my role there really is to help clients with tax information ideas and be a sounding board for any of the questions that they might have. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today, very quickly on the agenda, what we have here uh, and what we're gonna be discussing. Donations and tax, the basics of it. There's uh, always sort of a, uh, an area where they cross over. Donations in kind, so the donation of uh, something other than cash, which is what we're generally used to. Post-mortem donations, giving after we are already gone. Reporting donations, and then some comments on estate planning, specifically joint ownership, beneficiary designations, and wills, and estates. Okay, the basics. All right. What is a donation for tax purposes? A donation, just traditionally, very easy, you're giving money to a cause. For tax purposes, it's a little bit different. One, it's a charitable gift to a qualified donee by an individual, a corporation, or a trust, really any kind of taxpayer. That's charged with two terms there, charitable gift and qualified donee. A charitable gift is a voluntary transfer of property. We will come back to that a little bit later. It is very important that it be voluntary, especially when it comes to post-mortem donations. Voluntary transfer of property where limited or no consideration or advantage was received in return. So you're not giving up cash and receiving a service. No one's coming over to clean your house as a result of the donation. Not gonna happen here. <laughs> <laughs> a qualified donee, and this one's very important, this is one that I find the general public gets a little bit confused on. A qualified donee, this includes registered charities, registered municipalities, the Government of Canada or a province, and the United Nations. It includes those. There's a few others, but those are the core ones we're used to. A non-profit organization is not a qualified donee. And this is where when I was in public practice, so preparing people's tax returns, they would get really confused. They'd make a large donation to, say, a food bank not realizing that a food bank is a not-for-profit, generally a not a registered charity. What's the tax benefit of a charitable gift? Well, for an individual, they receive a donation credit, and that credit cannot exceed 75% of their income for the year. What is it valued as? Well, this is where it gets a little bit weird. Bear with me here. I always kind of struggle with this math. Every time I talk about donations, I have to revisit it. But it's disproportionate relative to how much you give and actually how much you earn. So the first $200 of a donation will result in a credit of 20%. So when a politician is saying, we're going to give you the advantage of a credit, and that credit's $1,000, that does not mean you're going to get $1,000 off on your taxes. Not at all. Uh, instead, it's the base amount of the donation, and then you apply a rate to it. So the first $200 of a donation, you get a 20% credit, so about 40 bucks. The remainder depends on how much you make. 
So if you're making less than $250,000 a year, the remainder of the credit is worth about 46%. If you make more than the top rate, 250, the remainder of the credit is worth just over half, 53 and a half. And we have the math here on the next page. So for someone who's making about 100,000, a cash donation of $1,000, they'll get a credit of $40 on the first 200 bucks, and they'll get a credit of 366 on the remainder. Total credit, $406. So what did it cost you to make that donation? $593, right? So if you're giving away 1,000 after the tax break, really what you're out is close to 600. For someone with a very high income, the remainder of the credit after the first 200 gives them about $428. So the cost of the donation has gone down. Total cost of making that thousand, about $530. Okay. What if you can't use the entire donation? As I said before, you can only claim up to 75% of your income. Anything that's left over gets carried forward up to five years. You can claim it in a future year. Donations in kind. And this is really where I come in and help my clients uh, out understanding cheaper or more efficient ways to give. A donation is in kind is whenever we donate something that isn't cash. Typically, we see people donate their shares or securities, real property or real estate, other property. I had a client just recently donate about 100 classic cars to a, a pretty worthy cause. Services. Services are a donation so long as the institution or charity that you're donating to was going to have to pay for those services anyway. So where property is donated in kind, and this is the hiccup that happens, you, the donator, are deemed to have sold it first. So if you donate a piece of real estate, you are deemed to have sold it at fair market value. That might result in a capital gain. Half of a capital gain is included in our income. Suddenly the cost of mo making that donation just went up. Unless we can fall into a special category. So. For certain types of in-kind donations, the capital gain inclusion rate, so when you have a capital gain, half is included in income. We call that the inclusion rate, 50%. That inclusion rate can go down to 0%, so no income on that amount, so long as the, uh, oh sorry, as a result of donating this type of property, the donor, they still get full fair market value credit for whatever the value was that they donated, but the taxes that you would get on the capital gain is zero dollars. The next page is the math. Oh, no, no, no. So what is, what's eligible for this in-kind zero capital gain? Donating qualifying securities, that's shares, bonds, mutual funds that are traded on a stock exchange. That's most shares other than private company shares. You can donate ecologically sensitive land. I've had the honor of dealing with one of those with a client many years ago or Canadian cultural property. That's one way that artists in Canada get out of having to report a bunch of income for their paintings. They just donate them to a special cause. Okay, so bear with me here. There's some math. Um, we're not all accountants. I'm terrible at math myself, so that is kind of irrelevant. Uh, so what I have is two scenarios here. One, the first one here, is where we would sell securities and donate cash. The other one is where we actually donate the securities in kind. So imagine yourself, you want to make, in this example, I've got a $10,000 donation. Imagine you want to make a $10,000 donation, and you have the option of donating cash, or whoever the registered charity is, United Church in this example, and you guys accept uh, qualifying securities, imagine we're going to donate those instead. So. Option one, you call up your broker and you say, I need some money to donate. I'd like you to sell some securities. We have this value of securities that's 10,000. Let's imagine for a moment that these are shares of Apple. They were acquired a long time ago and you only paid $1,000 for them. So if we sell them, we are going to have a capital gain of $9,000. Half of that is included in income. So that year I have to report income of 4,500. And the tax I'll pay on that is about $2,400, assuming I'm at the top rate. If you're in a lower bracket, a bit less, 
but you know, the general uh, concept here still applies. I then get a donation credit for whatever I donated, $10,000. So the tax savings, I paid 2,400, I saved 5,200, that means a total net, I saved $2,800 by donating that 10 grand. That means the cost of making that $10,000 donation was $7,100. That's what I'm actually out at the end of the day. Now, alternatively, if the registered charity would instead accept those shares of Apple in lieu of cash, well, let's see what happens. I donate $10,000 in securities. I'm still deemed to have sold it. So I'd have a capital gain of $9,000. But the government says you've made a qualifying donation, qualifying securities to a registered charity, no income inclusion. There's no taxes on that. The donation credit still gives me $5,283 off my taxes. So the cost of making my $10,000 donation is now $4,700. Quite a bit cheaper. And literally, you did nothing different. We just told the broker, rather than selling those securities, just give them to that registered charity. And regardless of who your investment advisor or broker is, they know how to do this. Very, very easy. The one hiccup that you can sometimes see is if the registered charity doesn't accept donations. That's pretty rare. Perfect. So not a concern for the United Church, right? We accept the securities and uh, you go from there. So as we can see, it's a very, very cost-effective way of giving. Yeah, please. What does our church do in example B? Oh, I'll give you $10,000 in Apple stocks. How do you manage that? We, we have actually done this, not, not with Apple, but with, and, um, for several times actually. So what we do is we have an account with a, a brokerage firm where the shares are received from your broker and we um, we undertake to sell those shares once they're in our broker's hands and that, that money just comes into our accounts in the church. So it's, it's really simple, it's like transferring from one broker to another. Once it's in our broker's hands, we look after it. Any other questions at this point? I'm sorry, I should have said, I'm happy to take questions as we go. Your donation tax credit at 52.83, how was that calculated? At 5283, so that, sorry, the, the way this donation credit was calculated was the same as before where the first $200 is 20%. In this case, I assumed we've got somebody who makes a lot of money. And so the remainder is 53 and a half. But otherwise it'd be, so let's say you've got a more normal income, the value of the donation credit would probably be closer to about $4,700, $4,800. Yeah. Uh, total, total 4800 rather than the 5200 We can't exceed 45.8%. Correct, yeah, yeah. A regular Very good. Okay, yeah. So I was going to make the comment, and, and I think about this myself, and I go, why am I making cash donations to Crossroads? Why, I have a stock portfolio. I should be automatically, every month, transferring stock to Crossroads Broker. It doesn't make sense, based on that example, it doesn't make sense for me to use my own cash. Correct, yeah. No, that's, that's an entirely correct. If you have donative intent, so if you want to give and you do have a stock portfolio, it is by far the cheapest way to do it. Now, to be very clear, we are talking about what's known as non-registered investments. If you have an RSP, that's very different. If you donate part of your RSP, you are deemed to have taken that RSP out. And that's regular income. There's no rules that help you out on that. Other than, I mean, you still get the credit, but you have to include it in income first, you'll be out some money. Exactly right. 
That's exactly right. Yeah. So the comment was, you know, the government gives you a deduction when you contribute to your RSP, so they can't really give you an added benefit of a credit afterward. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, so the question is, um, is this just, I'll use the term intervivals, Latin for while you're alive, or is this post-mortem as well? The math is the same, but the circumstances can be very different, and we're going to come to that one. Yeah. Yes? So I want to ask a question of Ken. So as the person who also receives the gifts of securities and processes all of that, I happen to have attended finance meetings when you've been like, oh, this is a pain in the neck, blah, 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 So is there a sense in which doing that monthly would be a bit tedious? Yes. <laughs> but, but is it just our broker generally? Are there fees associated with this third car broker? Could be fees. There, there are. When they receive the money, and then you. Yeah, there, there, there is a small, a small fee associated with uh, Crossroads broker and receipt and, and sale of the funds or sale of the securities. Yeah, it's um, for convenience. It's a discount broker um, Q trade, I think, and uh, the fee isn't that much. And it's something like that. Yeah. That's a really good question because if you were to have more and more people donate, one of the things you would want to consider, the church would want to consider, is going away from discount to what's known as managed. The discount you get charged on the transaction. Managed, if you have a big enough portfolio, managed is you get charged on the amount of assets. So it doesn't matter how often these transactions are happening. And could I also say, like if there were enough members that did do what Ken is obviously going to do for the next time. <laughs> Not really, yeah. It would be nice, I, you know, it'd be nice to think that a, a charity or a not-for-profit could have a bunch of assets that are earning a bunch of income. There's restrictions on what a charity is allowed to earn, how much, the way it runs. You know, a charity is supposed to take money and give it away. It's supposed to be for not-for-profit ideas, so it's not to hold assets. Correct, yeah, That's because that's a profit motive. Yeah, we have to be careful there. Yeah, good questions, absolutely. Okay, uh, I think we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, when donating in kind, as we suggested there, the donor, the, the donor receives a donation tax credit equal to the value of whatever they gave away, just like cash. None of that credit is used to offset the capital gain. So that's the other part of this as well, is that if you're selling the securities and trigger a gain, part of your donation credit is just going to cover the gain itself. So it's nice to know that you're giving as much away as you can, especially because charities already have a challenge of seeing how much of their dollars can make it to the end cause. I looked into it, I hope this is okay, but the United Church is very high in the amount of every dollar that makes its way to the cause, 92%. That's exceedingly high. I got that information from a website called Charity Intelligence. They keep track of charities in Canada. Postmortem. Okay. What happens when you die? I am not qualified to stand here in front of the cross and tell you what happens when you die, other than what happens when you die for tax purposes. So, 
generally donations that are made from a deceased's will they can be claimed by the estate so after you pass away it takes about a year or longer to wrap up your estate and during that time if you have a portfolio of securities or if you have pension income that was still coming in you have taxable income your estate files a tax return so if you make a donation in your will you can generally claim it on the estate return you can also most often claim it on your final tax return that's our biggest tax bill on the day you pass away you're deemed to sell everything you own pull out your entire rsp sell the boat at a loss if you owned a boat but all your income comes due and so it's nice to be able to claim that final credit on your final return and if you can't use it in either of those you can carry it forward to a future year <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, I think my, I'm not going for it anymore. This might zoom forward eventually as this catches up. Okay, notes of caution, right? I have seen every problem you can think of when somebody has passed away. And depending on the wording of the will, you can get yourself into a little bit of tax trouble. So if the charity is a beneficiary of your estate, that is not a donation. So if your will says, when I pass away, sell everything I own, pay off my debts, give a third to child number one, third to child number two, and a third to the United Church, you did not make a donation. You made a bequest. They were simply a beneficiary of your will. The cause is still important. The money made it to the cause. But there just won't be any tax relief. The next one is relatively new. This came up a couple of years ago. A lawyer asked a question to the CRA. Every time a lawyer asks a question to the CRA, we get a response we don't want to hear. I said earlier that a donation must be voluntary. When you pass away, the person in charge of your estate is known as your executor. Now, their entire job is to follow what the will tells them to do. So if the will says, executor, you must make a donation, that was not a voluntary contribution. It sounds odd because it was voluntary when, voluntary when we wrote the will. But for tax purposes, your estate is technically your executor. So if my brother is the executor of my will, when I pass away, he is my estate. And I've forced him into doing something. Now, we haven't seen the CRA actually disallow any donations as a result of this yet, but they did say it sounds to us like that's vol not voluntary and we would probably disallow it. So getting around it, great question, generally means giving flexibility to the executor. I give one third of my estate to child one, one third to child two, and for the other third, I want it to go to some kind of cause and I give my executor the flexibility to do it. Now, George, you and I had some discussions uh, a few months ago, and one of the comments I made to you was, my preference is always that you give with a warm hand if you can. It makes everything easier, and this is one of those concerns. I just, I, I'm just going to repeat what you said. You said that so we, we shouldn't put it in our will. Like, you shouldn't put it in your will. Okay. Sylvia, that's what he said. Give with a warm hand if you can. So if you put like a percentage in there, just like you're saying a third for the Yeah. But if you put in a percentage. Yes, so you can do a percentage. I'm about to give a big note of caution for that. That's the next note of caution. Um, but generally you're still telling somebody uh, you must make this donation. Yeah. So I don't want anyone to run to their lawyer and say, I need to rewrite my entire will because there's a donation in there. Purses don't have trailer hitches. None of this is coming with you. The donation tax credit might be a little beneficial, but it, you know, at the end of the day, if what's important is giving, then we simply give. Uh, but if we're going to update our will, and everyone should be about every four or five years, it's something to talk to your lawyer about. Okay, 
Oh, here we go, the donation based on a percentage. Try to avoid it. Couple, try to avoid it if you can. A couple of things have happened. I always like to give a little bit of history so we can understand the tax consequence or uh, where we sit today. But uh, governments, Canadian governments of the last 20 some odd years really tightened up how much they were giving to charities and not-for-profits. As a result, not-for-profits and charities had to go out of their way to get every penny they were entitled to. If, you, if your will says, I want to give $10,000 to the United Church, let's use a different example. Let's say SPCA, That's because that's coming up. Uh, I want to give $10,000 to the SPCA. That's easy. The SPCA says we're entitled to $10,000. If your will says give one-third of my estate to the SPCA, the SPCA needs money. They will come to the estate and say, we want proof that we received one-third. Maybe we need an audit done of your estate. Maybe we need to dig into the financial records. So it can really complicate matters and result in very costly estate litigation. And there is nothing worse than having your estate have to go through the courts. You've passed away, you want things easy for your kids or your other beneficiaries. Uh, going through court is the worst way to make it simple for them. And that is the example coming up on this next slide. So this is relatively recent news. Uh, I think the court uh, case for this started in 2023. It is, or 2022? 2020. The 2020. Oh, there it is, 2020. It is still outstanding. This is still in the courts. A woman in her will left 10% of her estate to the SPCA. When she wrote her will 30 years ago, that was about $10,000. Since that time, she came in to about 10 million. So 10% of her estate was actually $1.5 million. And the family is contesting it, saying, mom never wanted to give that much money away. So this is gonna be a very expensive thing on all sides. Reporting donations, this one's relatively easy. You know, we, I always get a big mix of people who use an accountant, people who file their own taxes. And I've written here specifically where you claim them on a personal tax return. It's something called a Schedule 9. The reality is that if you're using tax software, generally you answer some questions. Did you make donations? Yes. The window pops up and says, tell us about those donations. Go to the next page here. Now, if you're donating in kind, you have to report two things. The donation, as well as the disposition of that asset. You got rid of it. So it goes on what's called a Schedule 3, and that makes sure that there's no capital gain included on your return. But again, if you're using tax software, the program's going to ask you the question, did you pay cash or did you sell a security? What if the CRA reviews my charitable donation claim? I have way more experience in this than I'd like to admit. Uh, when I worked at a national accounting firm, I was in charge of replying to CRA requests. They like to look into donations and they want to see every penny. Doesn't matter if it was the biggest donation I've ever seen, which was on the order of about uh, $480 million, or if it was the smallest I've ever seen, which was about $12. And so when we uh, report those to the CRA, they want confirmation. So we have to keep our receipts for six years. When it comes to donations, always hold on to them. And CRA is most likely to review donation claims within about a year of filing your taxes. So keep them handy after that, put them into storage. Where donations have been carried forward, the CRA wants confirmation that you haven't claimed them yet. So if they say we want to see donations for 2020, and it was actually a donation made in 2018 but couldn't claim yet, if you send it to them, they're going to send it right back. And they're going to say, prove to us you didn't claim it in the last two years. So you need to be able to keep track. Great, yeah, I, I, yes, I 100% agree with you. They should be able to take a look. However, the CRA receives very limited information. They, when we file our tax return electronically, all they receive are lines that say dollar amounts. They can't tell what's in that dollar amount. So they want to know for sure. And how many is that? Ooh, I myself would have handled 250 a year on average. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Is it worth it? <laughs> you know what? Quite often, I would not reply. If it was going to be too much work yeah. on a $10 donation, which the first 20%, $2 is worth you know, $2, uh, then yeah, generally, there, often we wouldn't even reply. Yeah. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit now about some estate planning matters, some extra things to think about, and this part is all about making your will or your estate as efficient as possible. And when I say that, what I mean is winding it up quickly because the states can get dragged through the courts or they can simply get dragged through the family for a very long time. The longest estate I ever dealt with, 25 years on, I was still filing tax returns for it. The estate owned a castle, that was the problem. We couldn't get rid of the castle, but aside from that. Uh, but I've dealt with many that were three, four, five years. Okay, first concept that I wanna talk about with estate planning is what's known as joint tenancy with rights of survivorship in contrast to tenants in common. Joint tenancy is a way that you can own non-registered property. A stock portfolio, a house, a car. And joint tenancy with rights of survivorship simply means whoever's name is on title shares it with the other individual. We typically see this most often in home ownership. You and a spouse or common law partner own it together. And if one of you passes away, there's no requirement to go and fill out a bunch of forms. There's no requirement to pay a bunch of taxes. If it's going to your spouse, it simply goes to your spouse. End of story. This is in contrast to a type of ownership known as tenants in common. Tenants in common means you own your own interest. We see this a lot with friends or with extended family. So for example, maybe my brother and I might buy a cabin together. I want to make sure that my share goes to my kids. We own it tenants in common. I'm able to sell my share if I want to. I'm able to give it away to whomever. Um, but on my passing, it doesn't go directly to my brother. The problem is that if it doesn't go directly to another individual, it needs to go through my estate. So if I own a property tenants in common with my brother, when I pass away, the court needs to give me a stamp of probate Whatever goes through my will is subject to a probate fee of 1.4%. A typical home in Vancouver at about a million dollars means you're going to lose about $14,000 to probate. And so joint tenants with rights of survivorship, if my brother and I owned it in that regard, I pass away, it goes to him. I am still deemed to have sold it. I still have tax. Maybe if not if it's our principal residence, but if it's a cabin, I might still have tax if there's any capital gains but the courts aren't getting involved, right? It just transfers to them very specifically. So upon death, generally the property just goes right away, whereas in tenants in common, we've got to get the courts involved. So what does this mean for setting up your will? Next slide, thank you. Um, so quite often what a lot of my clients will do is as they get older, and they have a non-registered account of a stock portfolio, they know that if they pass away, everything's deemed to be sold, they'll pay their capital gains tax, but the courts still have to give the stamp of approval and charge probate. So what we will do is we will put a child's name onto the account in joint tenancy, or sorry, joint tenancy with rights of survivorship, that's the full name of it. Once that I've passed away, the portfolio will go directly to them. Courts are not involved. I still pay taxes, still deemed to have sold it, but the child gets it. Now, what if you have more than one child? Generally, we don't wanna put more children's names on the account. And this is where we got some relief from the Supreme Court of Canada. A few years ago, there was a really important court case where one child was put on title and not the other ones. And the child that was put on title tried to argue that it was theirs. Mom and dad said, this is mine. <laughs> Absolutely. And the courts came out and said, you know what, from here on out, if you put an adult child's name on your account in joint tenancy, we're going to assume that you're just giving it to that child to then give to their siblings. So they hold it in trust for their siblings. So we get out of probate, we get out of the probate fee, but we still make sure that our beneficiaries are getting exactly what we wanted. So the child is deemed to be holding it in trust for all the other beneficiaries, including any registered charities, if they are, in fact, beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. and, um, okay, sorry. Oh, too much um, anyways, it, um, that, that, that particular child that's holding it in trust, when you say that on your will. Sorry, 
when you say that on your will, then can you determine on that will that if it's held in trust that the other siblings will get this much percentage, like each, so you can list that on there so that it saves that child who is holding it in trust to do all the responsibility of that. Absolutely, good question. And so really, when you do have something that's in joint tenancy, it avoids your will altogether. But, so the child gets it, and then they are deemed to hold it with the exact percentages as outlined in your will. So if your will says, take everything that I have, sell it, and give it in equal shares to these four people, the child who gets that portfolio must divvy it up in the exact same proportion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good question. So, of course, it's not without problems. When you own something in joint tenancy, there is potential loss of control, right? We've got another person's name on there. Exposure to creditors. This is a nasty one. A woman put her son in Burnaby on title of the property. Uh, he also went on title for the mortgage. That was the big no-no at the end of the day. The courts didn't like that, but what happened was the son was sued. He didn't even live in the property and mom was just trying to avoid probate and avoid everything going through her estate. He, it, it seems simple, absolutely. He got sued, mom had to give up half of her property. So I don't like adding a kid on title until you're quite a bit older, right? The next comment is exposure on marital breakdown. Why add your, your child to title if the child is 30 or 40? Right? We know statistically they're more likely to get sued, they're more likely to get divorced. But if I'm 90 years old, if I'm approaching the end of my time and my kids are in their 60s, probably it's a safe bet that we'll be okay putting them on title. There can be some tax consequences. So remember I said you're deemed, the child is deemed to be holding it in trust. If instead I said, I'm not giving this to you to avoid probate, I'm giving this to you now because I want you to have it. I want it to be yours. Well, I'm deemed to have sold half of the account. So we gotta avoid that too. The big linchpin here, get legal advice if you're gonna do something like this. Okay. Gifts during your lifetime. As I said before, I prefer seeing donations with a warm hand, inter vivos, while you are alive. It's cheap and it's very easy. And we're talking all types of gifts. Gifts to register charities, gifts to family. Right? We get to a point in our life where we don't need as much for our own survival. Time to start helping the kids with their mortgages, helping the grandkids save for school. This can trigger capital gains if we're gifting securities in kind. So if I'm gifting part of my portfolio to a child or a charity, you need to have sold it. Hopefully I can get out of the taxes. If you have more than one child and you're making gifts to one child because they need more help, Usually what you want to do to keep peace in the valley is to make sure that the will says Account for anything I've already given away. I see that quite a bit in an addendum Five years ago. I gave child number one a hundred thousand dollars So the first gift out of my will is a hundred thousand dollars to the other child then they'll split everything else 50 50 You can also structure it as a loan My father-in-law also a tax accountant didn't trust me at first. We're 23 years in, so he trusts me now. But at first he wasn't really trusting, and he had made some sizable gifts to my wife. He structured it as a loan. So he said, to my wife here, I'm gifting, the, or I'm loaning this to you. And in the event that you get divorced, I'm taking that loan back. So that makes sure that I couldn't get my hands on that share of the property. Ah, there you go. Yeah, we see it quite a bit. So if you keep it as a loan, it just kind of, it, it protects the family as a whole, really. Registered accounts. Okay, when we talk about registered accounts, we're talking about tax-free savings account, RRSP or RIF if you're over the age of 72, or a locked-in retirement account or a LIF if you're over the age of 72. So these are sort of the primary savings accounts for most Canadians. Now, for, a, for estate planning purposes, Registered accounts do not go through your will. They do not get governed by the terms of the will. In the case of a TFSA, we have what's known as a successor holder. If I pass away, my successor holder is the person getting this account. Generally, that's a spouse. 
If it goes directly to a spouse, not only is there no tax at all, but the account just joins their account. So if I pass away and I leave a TFSA to my wife, it simply becomes part of her TFSA. It becomes a little bit bigger. Absolutely. In the case of a RIF, same concept, we call it, call it a successor annuitant. So, so long as I have an individual that is my successor annuitant, that RIF will not go through my estate. No probate, no getting locked up in court. We then have the concept of contingent beneficiaries. So should I pass away, my wife gets my RSP. If my wife predeceases me, my contingent beneficiaries are my children. So it's always important to have someone next in line for all those uncertain events that happen in life. So, so if, like, I'm a widow, okay, and I understand what happened at that point. Sorry. Um, sorry. Um, so, as it stands right now, my daughter would get the estate if I die. Just a single daughter. Okay. So, it would just transfer evenly to her the same situation, so you wouldn't have to deal with any tax or implication there. Yeah? Just thought I'd ask. Well, sorry. Regarding RSPs, uh, is there any room for me to pass any benefit from my RSPs onto my two daughters? <laughs> yeah, so on your... It, even if you have this contingent beneficiary or a, a backup other than your spouse or common law partner, the tax is still triggered on your passing. You are still deemed to have pulled that RRSP or RIF out on that day. It's just that it goes to that child or that next beneficiary without any uh, interruption with the court or probate. It doesn't touch your will. Um, so it makes it more efficient. So your daughters can certainly be the uh, contingent beneficiaries. They will get the accounts right away after you've passed away. But you still pay the tax as though you pulled out that RSP on that last day. Unless, unless it is an adult child that is disabled. Then it can go to them. So if they're, if they're relying on you for the necessities of life, shelter, food, that kind of thing, then they can, it can transfer into their RDSP. Registered Disability Savings Plan. We also have beneficiaries for registered pension plans and life insurance policies. So if you don't have a beneficiary assigned to either of these, again, it's going to go right to your will, pass through your estate, we pay probate fees on it. All right, do you have a will? I love asking this question. I ask it three times a day. Typically, I have three meetings with clients every single day. At the end of the meeting, do you have a will? If they don't have a will, I tell them they're grounded until they can go and get it done. What's the problem? 51% of Canadians don't have a will. It's hard to believe, but I can tell you, in my experience, uh, that might actually be a bit, uh, a bit low. 25% uh, say, I don't need to worry about it because we're too young. I hate to break it to you, but it doesn't matter how old you are. We're temporary here on this planet. 23% say it's not worth it because I don't have enough assets. Let's assume, you're, assume your only asset is your home. That's enough of an asset to go and get a will. Absolutely. If, that get, if you don't have, well, we'll come what happens if you, you don't have a will, but not having the will even on just the home, that becomes a very costly endeavor. 18% say, no, it's too expensive to get a will made. It's costly. I do not like shelling over a couple grand myself, but it will make everything that much better. 8%, we don't want to think about dying. Not something that I will tolerate when you walk into my office. We're going to talk about what happens when you go. 5% say it's too time consuming. Well, what happens if you don't have a will? <laughs> well, you die intestate. <laughs> dying intestate, literally dying without a will. What happens? You can't choose who your beneficiaries are. The courts will decide for you. How and when your assets are distributed. We know our kids far better than the courts do. And if you have a child that you know cannot manage money properly, the courts won't be able to tell that for you. They'll simply give the child the money. It could be gone within the next year. Whereas if you had a will, 
you could have said the child will receive a little bit up front, they'll see, receive a little bit the year after that, and a little bit the year after that. You can't determine who will administer your estate. Again, the public guardian trustee or the courts, they'll decide. And you cannot determine a guardian for minor children. This is heartbreaking to see in practice. And I've seen it far too many times. You also can't plan on how to minimize taxes. It's simply part of the game. A properly structured will is usually done in conjunction with a tax accountant that determines the best way to set things up. Is your will up to date? Have you gotten married? Have you gotten divorced? Have you gotten separated? All great reasons to redo your will. A change in financial circumstances. Maybe you've come into a lot of money. Maybe you sold a business. There's a bunch of excess cash. Time to look at the will again. Did you have a change in residence? You moved to the US, we need a new will. You moved from the US here, you need a new will. Maybe you dispose of an asset that was specifically mentioned in the will. This happened in my family. My dad very specifically gave a certain painting to one of uh, my siblings, and the painting no longer existed. Uh, by the time it had already been given away, my dad forgot about it. Uh, and so that's a pretty mild example, but there are ones where you can imagine bigger assets being left that no longer exist. Maybe a beneficiary develops a problem, a problem in their relationship. Right? You've got a child that you want to leave money to, but you know for the last couple of years they've been having issues in their relationship. Substance abuse or creditors, or maybe a beneficiary or executor has passed away or developed mental capacity issues. If your executor on your passing no longer has capacity themselves, well, the court's not going to let them administer the will. It's almost like dying in testing. Yeah. And then I have to decide who is going to change any benefit that their minor and it could be her husband, who's long gone, basically, because there's no other uh, distant relatives. Um, Picking an executor is complicated. Yeah, and so your comment, sorry. There's bigger complications there. Absolutely, yeah. And the comment was you've got. Yeah, you have the one child. What should happen if she develops capacity issues, predeceases you, any of those issues? If they're listed as the executor, that's problematic. Who would we pick otherwise? Also, as we approach the end of time, a lot of our friends are also approaching the end of their time. It becomes even harder to pick the right person. There are options, right? You can pick a lawyer to do it for you. That's expensive. It's expensive after you're gone. Uh, you can pick a trust company to do it for you. I usually advise that if there's trouble in the family. If the kids aren't going to get along, let's get some third party to handle it for us. Absolutely. Big concerns. Oh, and so here we are. Now we're going to talk about personal representative very quickly. So for estate planning, we've got our executor. That's for our will or our estate. My big piece of advice here, pick someone younger than you and make sure they are not a U.S. citizen. We don't want the IRS involved. Correct, yeah, you have two kids, one's in the US, one's here, one in the US. If they are the executor, the IRS may want to tax your estate, so any income after you're gone, but more importantly for your son who's in the US, they would have to file what's known as FATCA forms, foreign uh, reporting, because they're in control of foreign accounts. Yeah, so avoid that if we can. We can also, uh, in our estate planning, pick a trustee. So those circumstances where we're leaving assets to kids on a slow basis, we want them to be paid out slowly over time, we typically pick a trustee, someone that will be in charge of that. For incapacity planning, the other two documents that are associated with estate planning are powers of attorney. So a power of attorney is simply a form that says, in the event that I am unable, so I'm incapacitated, or maybe I'm just out of town, here's somebody I appoint that can make financial decisions for me that can go into the bank and take out money if they need to, that can sign forms for me. Just as important as a will. In fact, I had a lawyer in my office a few years ago who said, if you only had enough money for one document, get a power of attorney before you get a will. 
A bad example, and again, I've seen this before, spouse number one ends up in the hospital, totally incapacitated. The wife did not have a power of attorney. She needed to sell the house to pay for his care and couldn't. She was not in charge of his share of the home. Then we have representation agreement. And this is like a power of attorney, but for healthcare matters. And it basically lists, here's what my wishes are in the event that I become incapacitated in the hospital. My dad had one, it made it infinitely easier. In my line of work, we call this the gift. Give the gift to your kids of letting them know what you want to have happen. Do not leave it incumbent on them to make the tough decision about your health care. Because if you've got more than one child, anyone out there, you know that those kids view things very differently. You always have the one kid who's really emotional and, you know, got to take care of mom and dad, and the other that's a little more factual, the accountants of the family, right? So clear it up ahead of time. Does the power of attorney last? Does the power of attorney last? Very good question. Very good question. And there's two types of powers of attorney. There is an enduring power of attorney and a regular. A regular power of attorney is, right now, for this moment, here's the person in charge of my finances. An enduring power of attorney says, here's the person in charge of my finances, and if I become incapacitated, they can continue to do that. Yeah, very good question. That's it for the estate planning. That's it for the donations. Um, Happy to take any questions. If you've got uh, something that's a little more personal that you want to talk about, feel free to stick around. I'm happy to stay as long as uh, the questions uh, keep coming. Um, but otherwise, I hope that was useful uh, for everyone. Excellent. Very good. As it comes or as it pertains to the donations that we talked about, um, if you are like me, or even the estate planning matters. If you're like me, you won't think of a question right now. You will think about it at two in the morning. I don't answer the phone at two in the morning, but I'm more than happy to answer the email that I get the following day. George has my email address, and George, you're more than welcome to pass that out. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good question. So the question was, you know, do you charge a fee for service for what I do outside of just all the Brown clients? Uh, I do not. However, I am a financial literacy volunteer with the uh, Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada. And in that capacity, I made it a mandate to just help out where I can. Yeah. So you're, again, more than welcome to ask me questions. Absolutely, yeah. Email generally works a bit better because I'm able to, to spend a bit of time on it. But yeah. Or simply to act on the client's behalf to provide services for creation of a new bill. Ah, that's a good question. So I provide very specifically. I provide the ideas. I provide the information required so that you can take it to your professional to set in place. So I don't actually prepare wills. I don't prepare tax returns. It's just on the information side. I'm not insured to do that kind of work. The hope is, I mean, I used to work in public practice accounting. I charged $800 an hour. I didn't get that money. The money went to higher ups, uh, but I don't charge anymore. So my hope is that I can give you information that helps you avoid the big bill when you go to talk to your accountant or lawyer. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the, the space. Pass the mic to John here. And I'll just remember with you all these, which Vicki has given us a little box of. So even if you have an up-to-date will, you still might want to take a look at this and see if there are any nuggets in it that uh, are new. There are a couple of questions, but I didn't get them in. You were talking about the carry forward and carry back of charitable donations. Now, if somebody was to pass away in the first couple of months of the year, and they had carry over from the previous year, they may not have enough income to absorb that charitable credit. Does that pass to the estate?
It depends on the level of their donations, of course. Correct. I suspect no. I suspect no because technically the individual and their RC are two separate legal entities. So that, that if the charitable estate has a tax credit that it can't use, does that carry back to the personal return? Correct. Yeah, that it, so it goes one way, but it doesn't go the other. I dropped but with of course thank both Vicky for the, her presentation and material and yours it's been an excellent presentation. I mean I happen to be sixty years in the same profession here as a CA, not as a CA. Uh, we do thank you very much for giving of your time. It's been wonderful material. It's great reference material. I know that we're trying to download it so that others can access it. So the purpose of this was of course to remind people of the importance of having a will and having it continuously reviewed and updated. Uh, circumstances change. We have to be timely with these things. So again, thank you very much. But I have a second objective, of course, and I'm called the closer. And I'm here to solicit money, you see. On behalf of Crossroads United Church, going back to the minister who asked, why don't people give to their church? I'm asking, why the devil don't people give to their church? We would love to have donations into an endowment fund or the operating fund before you die and after you die, okay? I could even take Ken Clark's concerns. I wouldn't want him to transfer monthly his monthly contribution to the church, but maybe he could do it semi-annually to avoid the bookkeeping. But of course, then we have to worry about the cash flow for the church. But the benefit is there. Certainly, if people don't take the opportunity to plan their estate, they risk exposure to taxation beyond the needs. They risk exposure to probate fees. Uh, you know, the, the whole concern about planning ahead is to make your estate do as much for you after your death as you would have wanted to do. So again, on behalf of the Crossroads United Church, thank you very much for coming and giving us so freely of your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. When they sold their house and they went into a rental, the condo, and they rented. And so when my mother, well, when my father passed away, then my mother went out searching and bought a place. And, uh, and so at the point when she was not well, then she went into care, assisted living, and sold that place. So when she did pass away, there was no probate because of she was in, in assisted living or rental at, the, you know, at that time as well. So these are thoughts that if people are holding their house and it's getting too much for them or whatever, then they can go and find a condo that you can rent and still have independent living. It absolutely is, yeah. My mother, very almost identical scenario, but she's not in care, but she sold the family home and has just moved into a rental and has put my name on the accounts for the remainder of the siblings. Although we're pushing her to make sure that she enjoys it all while she's here. She's a long, long time member of the United Church and makes her donations yeah. to uh, out in Tawasa. Um, but you're exactly right, if we can avoid the state or the, the courts and probate altogether, that's a good thing. And the good news is the government is more than happy for you to avoid probate. They do not want us in the courts. They would prefer if we were gone. That's why they give us all these options to get out of it. So everything we've talked about here is totally legal and in fact encouraged. Yeah. 
Oh yes, yeah. Absolutely. Doing probate, doing the, the handling of the estate on your own is a costly and and it results in many sleepless nights. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Okay, I'll stick around for a bit. Any questions, concerns, please feel free to ask.